Okay. I, uh, it's my privilege, privilege to welcome you all here today. Uh, thank you for joining Akamai and Fujitsu on the webinar about your, uh, your cloud costs skyrocketing. I'm really excited to be talking about what is, we're really excited to be talking about what is really a real challenge facing companies today. And uh, in particular, the complexity, cost, uh, and other implications of people's cloud journey. I'd first last like to acknowledge the first Australians as traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is amongst the oldest living cultures in human history. I pay respect to the elders of the community and extend my recognition to their descendants. We'd love for you to stick around through the course of the webinar. At the end, we've got a couple of really exciting offers to share with you. Uh, and uh, so we hope you hang around till the end of the webinar to be able to leverage those offers. I'm super excited today to be joined by um, two real thought leaders in the space of cloud in the Australian marketplace. Uh, we've got uh, Matt Lin from Akamai and Abhishek Pradhan from Fujitsu. So first, I'd like to hand over to Matt. And, and Matt, I'd like you to introduce yourself a little bit and maybe a few moments on Akamai and what Akamai does in the marketplace. Certainly, thanks, Gavin. Thank you for the intro. Um, so Matthew Lin, Matt Lin is my name. Uh, I'm the director for cloud computing here at Akamai. Um, some of you may be familiar with Akamai, some of you may not be. Um, Akamai is one of those companies that um, you probably use every day, but many people may not have heard of. You know, we really secure, accelerate, and help some large organizations deliver their online services, both around the world, but also here in Australia. Uh, and more recently, we've been investing heavily in our cloud computing products, which we're going to be talking about more today. Thanks, Gavin. No worries. And Abhishek, maybe you could introduce yourself, please. Sure. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, and good morning, everybody. My name is Abhishek Pradhan, and I am the head of the hybrid IT portfolio for Asia Pacific uh, at Fujitsu Australia. Uh, my role at Fujitsu and what me and my team do are bring a partner and own offers to market and we work with customers across a diverse set of industries uh, from energy uh, the power sector mining oil and gas financial services healthcare government public safety uh, public defense and everything around that uh, across everything in the hybrid cloud space all the way from your infrastructure and your networks to workloads in the public cloud uh, Prior to joining Fujitsu, I spent close to a decade at one of the larger hyperscaler CSPs, uh, uh, driving sales, consulting, and I also led uh, software engineering for a lot of the public cloud products and solutions that are used today. Uh, and I hope that uh, during our discussion today, I'll be able to shed some light on uh, the upsides and the downsides and how to be more cognizant of uh, your cloud adoption. Um, Gavin, back to you. Great, thank you, Avshik. Clearly, hyperscale cloud is both a blessing and a curse. Once upon a time, developers had, and, and, and infrastructure managers had a finite amount of resources uh, to constrain their thoughts, imaginations, their systems to. Now, with the elastic nature of hyperscale cloud or cloud in general, you know, people's minds can go crazy and, and really expand what uh, they were able to do. The, the need to, to make super efficient code and manage storage and use uh, ha has gone away in, in, uh, with the use of hyperscale cloud. But of course, that has introduced some other challenges uh, about around complexity, spread, cost, uh, the, and, and more recently, the, the hyperscale cloud providers have, have announced um, significant price rises. So maybe I can turn to you, Matt, first, and you can share with us what clients are saying to you about their ever-increasing cloud costs in, in the hyperscale world. 
Certainly. And uh, you, you mentioned it, a blessing and a curse. I think um, blessing, absolutely. Curse is probably a little bit harsh. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't quite go that far. Um, but we should definitely you know, sort of acknowledge the, the, the multitude of benefits that cloud has really brought to many organisations, you know, particularly in terms of the agility, uh, the speed, and in many cases, cost reduction as well, at least over the short term. So it's certainly bringing a, bringing a lot of innovation to the industry at large and to many of the businesses represented by the attendees here on the calls today. So we, we, we need to acknowledge that. Um, a curse. Uh, look, I think there is absolutely acknowledgement that as the cloud has scaled, um, cost has become a fundamental challenge. So more and more services have been moved to the cloud. Uh, people's services on the cloud have become much more complex uh, and as a result costs have gone up as has management overhead um, of managing those, those costs. And we're certainly seeing now as the economy has changed a little bit, we've kind of you know, lots lot of talk of recession on the horizon, customers are really starting to really look at their cloud costs and really understand the impact of that on their business. Um, and you know, that's certainly something that we're hearing from the customers that we're talking to. Absolutely, people do feel that their cloud costs are out of control. And many customers do also feel that they are locked in to their existing cloud providers and their existing cloud strategies. And you know, people are really starting to think, are having to think about what they can do with that. And look, so that's, that's, that's my, my experience, but look, that's also reflected in the data as well. Sorry. Um, Sorry, uh, yeah, Flexera run a really good report. Uh, usually comes out every sort of May, March, May timeframe. Um, and the latest one here is shows you know, quite clearly that you know, the top cloud challenges that many organizations are reflecting is managing that cloud spend. And you can see that's across all organizations, both enterprise and SMB. Um, interestingly, last year on this same report, you know, security was the top priority for many organizations with uh, cost becoming in a close second, now that's flipped. You know, cost is currently first. Um, also, the same report goes on to say that um, you know, customers are well over their cloud budget. You know, so typically they're seeing their cloud budgets grow by 30% year on year. Um, and typically they're over budget in their current year by 18%. And that's certainly creating a lot of attention from both CEOs, CFOs, and of course, CIOs as well. Uh, and importantly, um, you know, organizations also realize that they're not using the cloud optimally. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities to over provision the cloud and perhaps build more complexity into the cloud environment um, than organizations perhaps should. So many organizations acknowledge that they're overspending. Um, there is you know, up to 28% wasted spend that they currently um, uh, have on their, on their cloud view, on their cloud bill. And uh, finally, um, again, the same report is indicating that uh, organisations realise that they need to do something about this. So looking at the cloud initiatives that many of these respondents um, uh, have on their agenda for 2023, you know, cost optimization is absolutely the top uh, priority for, for all those organisations as well. Um, so certainly we're, we're hearing, we're seeing a bit of a, a change. We're seeing organisations realise that they need to reconsider their, their cloud strategy. And yes, that is largely driven by costs. And what about you, Abhishek? Uh, so broadly, I think uh, having worked on both the hyperscaler side and well, the end user side and now on the partner side, working with customers, helping them realize value in their cloud investments. Uh, I think the real challenge uh, that I typically see uh, is across all the aspects that I just mentioned, right? And I'll just take a moment to share some learnings that we have uh, from a very recent Gartner ITOCS conference in Australia. So typical market trends that Gartner spoke about was uh, you know, customers are looking at, you know, immersing more with the organizational fabric than just going cloud native to a large extent. And there's been quite a bit of hype around, uh, oh, if you're not on the cloud, you're missing out, you're not innovative enough, right? So that's led to a huge sprawl and a huge uptake in cloud services, uh, sometimes in a more planned manner, um, but, uh, to a fairly large extent, an unplanned manner. 
Uh, we've also seen the, uh, you know, increase of uh, shadow IT uh, for part of a better word, where because uh, businesses were constrained in trying to go to market and getting resources on time, on demand, uh, they resorted to using individual teams, uh, went on using corporate credit cards or personal credit cards to just spin up resources. So it went to a pretty large extent of undefined sprawl, uh, which meant that a specific subset of users uh, had the skills and then it did not translate into more of institutional knowledge. So retooling the workforce is another trend that is there in the market. Uh, then the whole acceleration around uh, how do you automate and go for platform engineering? Uh, automation became the buzzword, right? Specifically around robotic process automation. And people were uh, saying, well, we can go and automate everything under the sun. That's not true. Not everything needs to be automated or neither should everything be automated in that sense. You, in certain cases, you need to have a man in the loop, uh, so to speak, or you should have a person who can control those ingress and egress points. And then, Innovation was an afterthought, right? Everybody wanted to save money in the short run, but nobody looked at it from an innovation perspective. Are you taking a more planned and prescriptive approach in such a scenario? Uh, where I really see value from that perspective is uh, I see customers more going in the value phase of you know the optimal use of cloud. Uh, the land phase has uh, passed where most customers and most of our partners have established a cloud presence. Uh, the, the other second phase was, you know, you have unrealized value in cloud where, you know, build shocks uh, were very common, uh, incorrect workload placement will lead to thousands of dollars of overbilling usage. Uh, I've seen customers personally go and lift and shift entire data centers uh, to the public cloud. Uh, to a certain extent, I've also been involved in some of those engagements because back then, even we thought uh, from a practitioner perspective that yes, a customer should go to the cloud and there's really no value for having a physical data center uh, left anywhere. And it, it's turned out to be wrong uh, in the lo longer term. Uh, then there was a lack of perceived value. There were no placement and governance policies. And there was a broader you know, misunderstanding of what cloud uh, represents. But really now where we are seeing uh, from a customer perspective and from our perspective as Fujitsu, uh, you know, we have use cases which are driving uh, and guiding the usage. Uh, there are cloud operating models which support your digital operations. And this is, I would be remiss if I did not say this, uh, a lot of people misconstrue what digital transformation means. Like people have gone from doing traditional IT to uh, going on the cloud. And you know that's from my perspective, moving from your standard process to a electronic process, right? When you move from electronic to digital, and uh, we've had this conversation multiple times, that's where the real transformation happens. That's where the real magic happens, right? And that is a huge leap. So how do you realize the cloud value across the organization for this is really where you wanna drive that. And of course, the drivers are, to a certain extent, some people still go with the fear of missing out. Oh, I want to reduce technical debt. Uh, I have an overgrown data center. I want to reduce my on-premise costs. Uh, I want to have the latest and greatest in security and compliance. I want to enable digital transformation, right? But then if you don't uh, go there in a very programmatic and thoughtful manner, then it's going to become a problem. Kevin, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Abhishek. And, and, and Matt, look, extremely insightful. And, and clearly uh, the pendulum has moved from uh, your, as you spoke about uh, uh, Abhishek, everyone rushing in to just stick everything in the cloud. Uh, the, the pendulum has definitely shifted away from that. Uh, in fact, there's a number of articles uh, that I've been reading lately that talk about the 2023 being the year of repatriation. Now, whether that's moving things out of a hyperscale cloud back into on-premise or whether it's moving out of one hyperscale cloud into an alternative cloud, um, Clearly, something's happening. Uh, maybe Abhishek, you can you can talk to to this a little bit. And and, and do you think that this re year of repatriation, year of moving things out of hyperscale cloud, is real? Uh, I do believe it is real, and we I'm seeing uh, real customer use cases happening in this scenario. Uh, LinkedIn is also some, a place where we've seen a lot of companies and startups in the United States uh, publicly post that. 
they've gone from spending close to uh, 1.5, 1.7 million dollars annually on running workloads in the cloud to when they went back to their own data centers, they were running $400,000 uh, as their annual operating expenditure, uh, including getting everything repatriated. And they're happy because they see the ROI in that uh, over time, over a span of 10 years, uh, if you amortize the costs. Uh, I, I can cite a very interesting case. So back in 2014, I was involved in one of the very large migrations of over 700 odd very large workload VMs for a very big conglomerate in, in Asia Pacific uh, to the public cloud. And we worked over a span of six months to drain the data center because uh, they were spending $4 million annually on running those workloads uh, across Asia Pacific, uh, across multiple DCs. Uh, fast forward to 2021, and after we had helped them in that migration, they went with a different service provider for who were the managed services uh, incumbent uh, to come in and take over. Uh, and they were looking towards them for a transformation. Uh, 2021, we got pulled back into a conversation with them uh, and they are a current cu customer for us where they said, look, we don't really see value in the public cloud 100%. And we want to take away, because we, they never innovated. They just kept running virtual machines on the public cloud. And over time, if you just keep on running VMs, your storage grows, your, your data growth leads to more costs. Uh, they ended up spending the same amount of money that, uh, after five years on the public cloud annually, which they were spending on their data centers. So right now we are working with them through a very programmatic process of where we're looking long-term unused archival data that does not need to, uh, to be accessed frequently. We're helping them repatriate that and move that onto on-premise storage uh, solutions uh, for workloads which are not fit for purpose, which may be better served running, uh, who may be, which may be monoliths, which do not need uh, all the latest and greatest in the cloud, uh, which can probably work with just in you know, scaling up of the workload in the right manner. We're helping move those back on-premise uh, onto a limited subset of servers. And then there's a set of workloads where we are working with them now to really transform them and give them a digital native experience where either we decompose those applications or we start saying, okay, maybe this particular application can be a SaaS application, can use platform as a service services. And we have a, a one and a half year roadmap planned with them and we are executing on that as we speak, uh, where it's partial repatriation, partial transformation, and then uh, partial fully native cloud. Uh, that, that's just the reality of it. And you'll see a lot more cases of this coming forward. And, and, and Matt, clearly uh, Akamai also has a, a, a strong capability in uh, cloud, both uh, cloud computing. Do, are you seeing some of this uh, move away from the hyperscalers to, to find a more, uh, a more logical or better location for workloads to run? Yeah, look, we're certainly seeing customers rethinking their cloud strategy. Uh, and in terms of what that means for them going forward. Uh, look, and I think if you talk about repatriation and repatriation in the context of organizations now bringing workloads back in-house, um, I think that really kind of burst onto the scene for me back in 2021 when um, the VC firm uh, Andreessen Horitz, they, uh, they, they published a really interesting blog post. It was called uh, The Cost of Cloud, A Trillion Dollar Paradox. Um, really interesting blog post. It's a couple of years old now, but uh, the data presented in that was really interesting. And the premise was that in their portfolio companies, who, who of course are largely you know, fast growing IT organizations, so you know, which are special in certain respects. You know, but they did really emphasize that whilst cloud provides some really good promise and benefits early on in the journey for their portfolio companies, they went on to say that you know, it very quickly starts to put pressure on margins and erodes many of those benefits as the business scales. So I think you know, back in 2021, you saw some of the largest organizations you know, sort of you know, realize that. You know, Dropbox was you know, one of the examples that they used in that article back in 2021. And they really talked about how Dropbox saved $75 million a year by you know, bringing their workloads back on premise. Uh, and importantly, they actually improved their gross margins by 34% in doing so. Right? And it also goes on to say that in that SaaS or that high tech space, most of their portfolio companies are actually, you know, 40 to 60% of their cost of goods sold are going straight out the back door to the, the, the 
cloud providers. You know, so every ten dollars they make, let's say five of that goes you know, straight out as a cost to those cloud providers. And just imagine the Dropbox CIO when he goes back to his CFO and says, "Look, hey, I can give you back thirty-five percent, which then goes straight to your bottom line." A re really compelling conversation. But like I said, I think that IT market, it, there's some unique characteristics around that, but we are seeing that starting, that same sort of dynamic being seen across other industries as well. Um, and if I kind of go back to my personal experience and where we think that conversation is here locally in Australia and perhaps in the sort of broader enterprise market, um, you know, I just think that repatriation idea is still very much more of a thought bubble, bubble than a, sort of an actual um, mind swell, let's say. Uh, but what we are seeing is we're seeing customers who are launching new projects. So launching a new app, re-architecting an ex existing app. You know, they are certainly starting to question how they're going to platform that app going forward. Um, and we've seen multiple examples over the last 12 months where a customer have launched one of those projects. They've you know, churned through their whole cloud budget you know, for, for a 12 month period in the first three months. They've pushed pause and said, actually, we're not going to do it that way anymore. We're going to go and build this on our own infrastructure. Um, so we're certainly seeing, seeing that where there is a, a change which is being implemented, you know, re-questioning around, around how the platform is being delivered. And there certainly is a you know, conversation, I think, in the industry, which is you know, when does the pain of those increasing costs become too much large enough to sort of really instigate a, you know, a transformation exercise on their broader cloud infrastructure? Um, and one example from late last year, this was we were talking to a very large um, global media organization. Um, you know, and they, they were spending millions of dollars a month on their cloud, cloud budget. And every month, the CIO who we were meeting with, he would get an email from his CFO with a CEO in CC with their cloud bill saying, okay, this is it. And the next question was, you know, what are you doing about it? Right. And you know, that was happening every month. What are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Um, so we're certainly seeing that pressure come down, and I think it's going to be interesting to see when organisations realise that they have to pay, have to take action. So, so you, and I appreciate that the hyperscale clouds really have tried to create a Swiss Army knife of cloud, right? Every possible problem you can have, they try to solve, and you know, I, I remember my youth. Um, being stuck for a bottle opener, and I was able to use a Swiss Army knife to get into a bottle of wine. It worked, but it wasn't pretty, and it wasn't really a, an ideal solution. Clearly, um, from what you're saying, Matt, there's not as much repatriation happening yet, but people are picking alternative places for new workloads to land as part of their ongoing change strategy. So, so maybe you can talk to me a little bit about, you know, how, what are the considerations that people should take into account when they launch that next opening of the next bottle of wine, when they launch that next application, what consideration should they take into account? Yeah, no, really good point. So we talked about repatriation. That's part of being cloud smart. Um, but yes, you know, organizations are now sitting there and looking at, okay, in my multi-cloud environment, and so 80% of organizations now are typically you know, multi-cloud in terms of their, their, their current cloud architecture. Um, and they're being smart, okay, well, where is the right place to run those different workloads? Is it on-premise? Is it a hybrid cloud? Is it a hyperscaler or is it an alternative cloud? And I think it is important to call out your use of the term hyperscaler. Um, it's amazing. Most people, when they think about public cloud, they think about the industry as being AWS, GCP, and Azure. If you go up north, you would kind of get you know, Alley Cloud into the mix as well. But the cloud, the cloud market is changing. Right. So we're certainly seeing it become more and more fragmented. Um, and that's part of Akamai's strategy in cloud. We looked at what should we, we should invest in cloud 10 years ago. We decided that we didn't have pockets deep enough to go heavy in cloud. And we continue to invest in our security portfolio. And that's been a really you know, you know, good business for us. But now we see that market becoming more and more fragmented. Um, so you know, people aren't using a single cloud. Um, and Akamai, we're known for scalability, we're known for distribution, we're known for our edge computing and our edge security capability. Uh, we purchased a company called Linode last year, very much known for their developer cloud. They've been in the market for, for 20 odd years and have a mature a developer cloud type function. So we've incorporated that into our offering uh, and now we're really building out that end-to-end -end core to edge you know, cloud, cloud um, infrastructure today. Um, 
So but you're also hearing other providers come in from different angles, so industry clouds. IBM is becoming more and more known as uh, cloud for the MSI with that many of the compliance tools they bring, bring to the market. And then you also have uh, clouds which are more focused on different layers of the stack. Um, you know, CoreWeave has been getting a lot of attention. They're really focused on GPU cloud with the whole AI talk over the last couple of months. You know, they're sort of appearing in the news a lot. We've got Wasabi from a data standpoint. And Akamai kind of sees ourselves in that niche, right? Where we're looking at highly networked, highly distributed core to edge computing uh, and storage as well. Um, but look, sorry, I haven't really answered your question yet, Gavin, but um, you know, your question is really about well, what are the primary considerations when they think about what their right cloud architecture is and how they can be cloud smart. Um, look, and I think there's three primary considerations. One is cost, I guess one is performance, um, and one is you know, process or complexity, right? Uh, and each of those, uh, you know, different factors need to play off each other. Um, and cost is obviously, you know, is weighed according to how the other two, um, the, the, the weighting of the other two. Um, you know, but just without wanting to go into that too deeply, some of the key concerns from a performance standpoint, you know, obviously latency of the application, you know, can you deliver that from, what's the best, you know, infrastructure to deliver that from. Um, scalability is all, always a really important one, right? So if it's, if it's a, um, a service, perhaps a consumer driven service, which is going to see significant peaks and troughs. You know, cloud obviously makes a lot of sense in that space. Um, and then the performance piece, a lot of that again is about complexity, right? So if you look at the existing operational processes you have in place, um, does introducing another cloud, does that introduce complexity, which might erode some of the other benefits that you have? Uh, so I think organizations need to sit down and look at their applications. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the cost versus performance of a core banking system is going to be viewed very differently to your test and dev platform. Um, so organizations need to make those decisions in the right way. Great. And and so maybe I can call on you now, Abhishek. Uh, clearly, Matt called out cost and, and some other considerations. So it's, it's not just about cost. What, what are the other, maybe you can expand on some of the other considerations uh, when, when people are deciding on their a cloud strategy. So I, I think one of the key aspects that I would look at if I, from a customer perspective, uh, think, think of putting yourself in the customer's shoes, uh, is what's my business objective and is this particular cloud technology going to help me achieve that, right? What are the outcomes that I need to deliver along the way to meet that particular business objective, right? Uh, in, in a lot of cases when we see, you know, people building target operating models or, you know, uh, building out cases for the board as to why they should go to the cloud. Uh, they look at it from a technology perspective. It's l less about the business. And ideally, I feel it should be the other way around. Your technology should be an enabler for your business function to deliver better services or deliver better outcomes for your end users. They could be internal, they could be external. So you know, maybe paraphrasing a bit, but uh, if you take the case of healthcare as an example, uh, the healthcare sector, uh, what, is, what is the core functionality or what is the core business outcome uh, objective they're looking at is to deliver a better patient outcome, right? Uh, you want to be able to deliver better outcomes for patients to make sure, or, or you know, people you are providing uh, support for uh, in a more targeted manner, uh, in a more digital format where possible and make it easy and accessible. Uh, now you can build along the technology aspect behind it. So where that leads to is, am I using uh, the tech stack, which is fit for my purpose? Uh, am I designing a solution which is going to help me deliver on that business objective and deliver those outcomes towards that business objective? Uh, let's take a, like a very basic example. Everybody's jumping on the generative AI bandwagon, right? But then Gen, Gen AI is just one part of the broader AI puzzle. Uh, it, it's not like a silver bullet or a Swiss army knife. It's not going to solve every, all the problems under the sun that we have today from within the industry or any, any industry for that matter. Uh, maybe when someone talks to you, okay, you should be going and looking at AI, really you should be looking at like, do I really need AI or do I need to have machine learning? Uh, when machine learning could typically solve your problem, maybe AI may not. AI will give you that added, I would say capability to use what you develop on the machine learning uh, models to take and bring it and deliver a better outcome. So you can use those technology stacks to augment what you want to deliver. 
similarly, when you look at it from a very broad-based cloud perspective, uh, Edge Cloud makes a great scenario, but does uh, or do all the workloads that we have within that particular industry or for that particular customer, do all of them need to be on the edge? Maybe not. Uh, if you are maybe in the mining sector, yes, an edge cloud absolutely makes sense because you're going to have skinny WAN links uh, between your different sites, between your head offices, and you need heavy processing and computing capacity uh, and capability at the edge where the work happens. And you may be sending small batches of data uh, back once a week or maybe once a month to your head office. Uh, and then similarly in that aspect, do you need to have extremely data intensive implica uh, applications uh, running on the public cloud. Maybe if you're doing batch processing, if you need high performance compute, absolutely yes. You should have those applications running, but where you store that data uh, becomes a big question, right? Because data gives you gravity. The more chatty your applications and workloads are, the more data they generate, your data storage should be on premise or more near uh, or in the cloud scenario where it's more near to your data center or, or to your offices than being purely stored for long-term archival purposes on the public cloud, because that's where you're going to see real value uh, out of your cloud investments as you go forward. And, and so maybe we can talk a little bit about that intersection of agility, security, and cost effectiveness in a cloud strategy. Uh, Matt, do you, do you want to, pick up on that? Yeah, sure. So uh, agility, security, and cost effectiveness. Now, yeah, look, it's a tough question. Um, and I don't think there is the right answer, or, or perhaps I do. I think the right answer is you need to do both, to do all of those as, as, as well as you can. <laughs> Unfortunately, organizations can't drop the ball on any of those you know, core requirements, core business objectives at the moment. Um, you know, and I think, again, it probably kind of goes back to the particular application and what is the right way to deliver that. Um, going back to the example I mentioned previously, core banking, right? How important is agility on your core banking system? Probably not as important as being reliable and available. So you need to make the right decisions. It'll be a little bit off center in that um, in that mix that you just referred to. Um, you know, other other applications, again, sticking with the example I talked about previously, you know, test and dev, look, maybe the cost is going to trump it on that one. It doesn't need to be on a fully featured cloud platform. You can use um, a cost effective utility compute platform like Akamai's to sort of yeah. help you get some of those requirements. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on many of the, I guess, business objectives, which uh, Abhishek mentioned previously. And so, look, historically, uh, organizations in 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 the ancient days the, the old world the medieval times when I started in IT uh, people put in their capital budget they planned out for the next three to five years they set one strategy they stayed on the same strategy for three to five years um, they, they they bought the hardware they depreciated it um, and they they almost set, set and forgot the strategy for, for literally three years four years you know is, is that is that how you do an effective cloud strategy nowadays? Maybe, maybe Abhishek, you can um, answer that. Clearly, that's a set up question for you. <laughs> well, uh, I'll just uh, take a moment to talk through uh, what I see from uh, generally speaking around with our customers and partners in the industry. But I think the broad strategy that any customer should be following today and looking at taking a hard look at is uh, you revisit your strategy every three months. You cannot just you know keep your strategy uh, on paper and then keep looking at it once a year or you know maybe twice a year or maybe once every three to four years. You cannot do that. Uh, and the reason I say this is because it's not a moving goalpost, but it's a moving target. Your goal is still the same to make sure you get the best and optimum value for your cloud investments. You get a fit for purpose, fit for mission, uh, and fit for usage uh, cloud scenario that you're looking at. And what that means is, uh, if tomorrow you feel that there, your DevOps practices uh, in the cloud need to be adapted, you need to have that adaptive engineering capability to go and adapt to that change while that change is happening, either from a market perspective or based on your customer feedback or how your users are reacting sort of, sort of change. So what you're seeing on the screen over here is what I typically call as you know, 
you know, how you, our customers should be looking at doing the right kind of investment and what is the commodity line in this scenario. So the commodity line is when a technology reaches a particular inflection point where it's easier to partner uh, than investing in that capacity. So if you look at stuff such as your infrastructure architecture, uh, your ITSM administration, software patching, updating, your infra as a service, cloud engineering, uh, backup. So availability and resiliency are uh, two different concepts. A lot of people tend to construe them as mutually inclusive. They're not, they're mutually exclusive. Uh, your data center management, right? Your email administration, basic service provisioning, compute administration, web application development. These are all now commoditized functions within information technology. So this is really where the true value for our customers can be realized by in a partnering with say either Akamai and Fujitsu or anyone of their choice. Uh, but then really where you're looking at investing and where you want more bang for your buck uh, in the manner of speaking and achieve a very differentiated commercial value uh, you know, data science, uh, financial optimization or FinOps, you have digital platforms to look at. Uh, you look at your broader software architecture, you look at generative AI engineering, uh, look at large language models in that scenario, look at machine learning, uh, enterprise security architecture, you know, CI, CD pipelining, site reliability engineering. I see SRE becoming commoditized in the next two years. So, uh, think of having a set of patterns and practices in place as part of your broader cloud strategy, where tonight you might want to have it in-house, but tomorrow you may want to commoditize and you know take uh, advantage of economies of scale where partners bring that capability to you. Uh, and this is the way it's, it's going to work forward. And I, uh, I go back to the previous uh, example that I said of a large customer that we are working with right now. Uh, from 2014 until 2020, uh, after we had done the migration and they had gone back to their managed services provider, uh, the customer did not look at the cloud strategy, right? They just said, well, our strategy was to go to the cloud and we achieved that, but then was that the end game for them? That was not supposed to be the end game. The end game in the original strategy that was provided was for them to innovate, right? Try and decompose applications, look at fit for purpose workloads, and then start resizing, refactoring, following the eight hours process that we follow. Uh, somewhere along the line that was missed and they ran the whole environment for a couple of years and they realized that they got sticker shock. So it was maybe a bad, uh, you know, a misjudgment on their part. Maybe it was a bad judgment call on part of the service provider. I don't know, I cannot speak to that. But the lesson and the learning that we should all take away from that particular scenario. And there's a lot of other customers in the industry who will attest to the same fact is that if you don't revisit your target operating model once every few months, maybe once I would recommend once every quarter, you are going to go down into that same path of, or may, maybe into that same trap and you will end up losing sight of the bigger picture while you are focused on a smaller subset of it. Okay, thank you. And, and and Matt, maybe you can also cover that. And also, you mentioned a couple of times a hybrid multi-cloud strategy and, and people's move towards hybrid multi-cloud. Uh, clearly, everyone has multi-cloud. If they've got Spotify, argue if they've got Spotify and, and, and an Office 365 or a Hotmail account, they're already in multiple clouds. I mean, I think it's impossible not to be in at least more than one cloud. But you talked about... Uh, maybe you could touch on that you know strategy piece and uh what what practical steps people can take uh to go on a, a genuine enterprise hybrid cloud path absolutely um so just to, to emphasize your previous point around um you know ongoing management um Abhishek raised up a, a whole really a whole um load of really you know, critical points there and i think that's that is really reflected in the fact that 70% of organizations, going back to that FlexAero report, which I was referencing earlier, there's also a statistic in there which suggests that 70% uh, of organizations now have their own FinOps department, right? So uh, organizations are realizing this. They're realizing it's not set and forget, forget. They're investing to make sure that they stay on top of monitoring, governing their cloud spend and their cloud management. So absolutely, I think that's well recognized and uh, investments are making uh, happening to ensure that that is uh, uh, cloud, cloud, is, cloud spend is properly managed. 
Um, yeah, so going back to you know, hybrid multi-cloud and uh, I guess perhaps best practices that customers should be thinking about. Um, and it's a really interesting time. Uh, coming out of the back end of last year, it was quite interesting. I was having a lot of, a lot of conversations with customers. They're all sort of you know, getting comfortable being at the sort of mature end of their cloud journey now. I've got many of their apps and processes in place on cloud. Um, but I was really surprised at the number of organizations that came back and said, well, 2023 is going to be the year where we need to re-architect for the cloud. Right? So we now, we're on the cloud, we've driven a lot of benefits for that, but we also recognize that there's a lot of opportunities that we need to do to uh, drive more cost effectiveness and efficiency beyond what we call moving to a, a single cloud provider. Um, so organizations are thinking about this now. A, a couple of key things. Um, you know, Lock-in is absolutely driving a lot of concern uh, within the IT industry at the moment, IT professionals. Um, you know, organizations who have uh, invested a lot, a lot of what is now sunk cost into education, into processes, into tools to manage their cloud environment uh, really does make it very difficult to use, right? to, to, to move, I should say. Um, so organizations now are really having to start to think, okay, well, all those native AWS tools, as an example, which I've deployed across my infrastructure, have really kind of locked me in, um, and that's really restricting my options now. So how do I start to progressively unpick that? And look, I don't think we're seeing organizations go saying, okay, we're going to shift everything off the cloud, uh, but they are embarking on, well, what is our strategy? What does our cloud architecture look like two or three years from now? And then how do we start to embark upon that journey? Uh, and the key component there is portability. Right, so how do I make my cloud workloads more portable? How do I make sure that if uh, there's this one particular application over here, which I decide can benefit more from uh, being hosted on a different cloud, how do I get myself into a position where I can move that um, without you know, fundamentally unstitching many many of the operational processes yeah. I have? And, and, and clearly, the OpenStack architecture uh, that that is you know the Linode now Akamai. Uh, platform is is part of that. Absolutely, look, absolutely. And um, you know, just once upon a time, there weren't many tools. You kind of you, you, the the best and easiest option might have been the you know platform native tools we would call them on AWS. But uh, look, open source has come a long way over the last couple of years. There's uh, some really interesting open source tools out there which are continuing to evolve and become easier and easier to use and more fully featured that organisations really should be looking at now. Uh, Terraform, Kubernetes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, provide a really strong platform for that. Um, and you know, that's, that's really absolutely accelerating. So I think organizations now, they're starting to look at, okay, well, what are those open source elements that I need to be uh, introducing into my environment? Um, and again, going back to our investments, um, I guess Akamai is really focused on building out uh, cloud infrastructure, which is focused on you know, delivering the core services really well, you know, really cost effectively, um, and in an open source and easy, easy to use manner. Right. So how do you make sure you're working with a cloud partner who supports those open source tools? And then how are you taking more ownership of you know, that cloud architecture and those tool sets and leveraging open source where possible? And, and Abhishek, what about from you? What, what's a practical step a company could take uh, to, to, to uh, architect or think more openly about what hybrid multi-cloud might mean for them and their future? Uh, there's actually a couple of steps that any organization can take starting today. I mean, just from a hybrid multi-cloud perspective. And I think the broad idea is that you place an emphasis on both partnering and attracting and developing and maintaining the best talent, right? You, you, you don't need to do everything in-house or you don't need to outsource everything as well. Right. Uh, most companies try to gravitate between the two extremes of the spectrum. So it's not the right way. So you have a good mix of which functions, like I said before, you want to commoditize and you want to partner with and which functions and capacity you want to spend more time, energy and money on developing in-house. Uh, plan multi-cloud really carefully. Right. Uh, the industry players are now balancing between uh, the hyperscale, mid-scale and private cloud. So you really need to take a look at it from a perspective of if I'm using a cloud service provider, is it fit for purpose? Uh, is it serving and supporting my business needs and requirements? Uh, if it is a low cost workload that needs to be at the edge, uh, 
fair enough. If it's something which is dev and test, which uh, I can run as a bad job, maybe yes. And take, take a workload centric view and a business objective centric view when it comes to adopting that. And again, uh, just because everybody, uh, you see a lot of statements in the market that uh, we should be introducing and going on the cloud or maybe we're not doing enough don't get caught up in that whole fear of missing out the cloud's here the cloud's not gone anywhere and uh, if you look at it from an industry perspective uh, we still see uh, a huge chunk of customers uh, i would probably say almost 80 to 85 percent of it workloads globally are still not on the public cloud right you, if you, even if you do an average sum of organizations and a sample size, they will say, yeah, well, I typically have between 15 to 20% of my workloads on the public cloud. Uh, the remaining 80% are still on premise and either they don't know what to do or they are stuck in a quagmire as to how they should go about it. Mm -hmm. So take a very methodical approach, uh, plan properly. Uh, like Matt said, use open source tools where possible uh, and invest in the right capacity and the right capability versus going all in. Okay, thank you. Um, that's been great. Now, I know that you both have uh, a couple of real world case studies uh, that uh, you can talk to. So maybe uh, who wants to go first? And, and I know, well, maybe I'll, I'll invite you, Matt, to go first and um, talk about uh, your case study. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Gavin. Um, yeah, look, at, at, absolutely. Um, Akamai, along with partners like Fujitsu, we're working with a number of providers across uh, Australia and the region to really um, you know, help them overcome many of the problems that we've just talked about. Uh, and one example here which we can talk about today is, is Zolvit. Um, you know, so that very much fit into that sort of SaaS high-tech uh, example that I was referring to with uh, the VC, VC industry further. There are you know, I guess a maturing uh, legal SaaS provider. They're based out of India, but they deploy their services, I guess, into the US and uh, a, a number of other large markets. You know, but they we said they enjoyed the benefits of, uh, I guess, leveraging AWS um, in their growth phase as they built out their services. Um, and as they matured, sort of coming into, uh, I guess, 2023, they realized that they need to, needed to have a look at what their cost profile is of the business, right? So the market has changed for for, uh, for, for for the IT industry and SaaS providers. They're now having to look very closely at how they uh, preserve cost and drive margins. And uh, Zolvit, they saw an opportunity to work with uh, Akamai, uh, leveraging our cloud computing platform uh, to really drive you know, cost benefits across their platform, but at the same time reach that global audience uh, as well. Uh, so they were um, able to save up to 50% in costs in terms of you know, that core cloud infrastructure that they were they were leveraging. Great. And uh, I think Apashek, you also have a, uh, a a case study you wanted to share. Hang on, I'm just to, I'm just trying to figure out where my. No, no is. that's fine. Um, ah, there you go. There you go. Uh, so I'll just speak at, uh, about uh, Blue Scope. Uh, Blue Scope is a large Australian steel products conglomerate, uh, and they were looking at getting higher performance with hybrid cloud. And Blue Scope is an interesting organization. Uh, they supply a large amount of steel, not just to the construction industry across uh, Australia, but they export quite a bit. Uh, across the region and internationally. Uh, and they also provide a large number of specialized steel solutions or alloy solutions to uh, heavy machining industries, defense sector, and other areas around it. So what Blue Scope really needed to do was, you know, re-platform its legacy on-premise data lake to a modern cloud platform. Uh, and they wanted to improve the performance and availability and scalability for it. And as we started going through the discovery phase, we realized that uh, Blue Scope had a large amount of really interesting and proprietary data that you could they could use to create their own models out of, and they could use that to improve uh, across a wide swath of their businesses. Uh, 
as we went through the solutioning process, uh, we started taking the data uh, sets and moving them into a, turning them into a data lake. You had different independent data warehouses which were running in independent factories, and they were not connected. So there was uh, they were not able to get that efficiency of scale. Uh, so we ended up creating a data lake, which today is over 100 terabytes, and there are 20 different data models which under, uh, no, underpin the enterprise forecasting and reporting. Uh, they have a, now today a modern data platform with minimal disruption. And one of the best feedback uh, items that we received from the customer and their technology teams was uh, that while Fujitsu went above and beyond on many occasions, uh, overcoming many hurdles in the success of the project, uh, the core objective of the business was to streamline their spending and efficiency across multiple different areas. And what that, so think of it from a perspective where even a 3% improvement margin uh, adds tens of millions of dollars to your mm -hmm. revenue. Uh, this is what we were able to achieve with Blue Scope Steel, and we are still a great partners with them, and we are helping them scale that data lake and build out multiple new uh, data models uh, that they can use, and they're now selling them to other partners and other customers in the industry as well. Great. Thank you. And, and look, uh, we're, we're coming close towards the end of the, of the uh, webinar. And I, I know we said to everyone that we were going to, we had some exciting offers available to uh, people as part of their uh, participating today in the webinar. And people should see a, a pop up on the right hand side of the screen. We've got two uh, exciting real world things you can do. Uh, firstly, uh, Akamai has um, kindly offered a hundred US dollar uh, credit for anyone that wants to sign up on. Uh, their cloud platform and try it out for yourself. So get get the most out of some open source. In fact, uh, I don't make too much of an out of it, but a hundred dollars actually does buy you quite a bit of access on the uh, Akamai Linode platform. Uh, and uh, so please feel free to click on that link, as I said, on the right hand side and, and make the most of that. And uh, clearly uh, Fujitsu sees as part of its uh, it's go to market and how, how it helps clients as uh, offering uh, cloud uh, assessment workshops. And so the other offer uh, that we uh, are sharing with you today is a free cloud assessment uh, workshop to go and have a look at your existing footprint and uh, see if there are opportunities for, for you to improve that uh, footprint, whether it's from a, an efficiency, security, clearly a cost is a big driver. Um, so that they, you know, if you sign up for a free assessment, uh, you can do so by clicking the link. You will need to scroll down to the bottom when you get to the web page. If it doesn't take you there, and put in your details, and we can schedule a uh, a cloud assessment for you. So uh, we, and there you go. There's the there's up on the screen. You can you can uh, scan. Uh, for that $100 credit or click through on those offer pages to, to get to the uh, free cloud assessment tools. So before we conclude today, and we will try to get you out of here right on time, uh, I don't know whether any questions have come through. I haven't seen any pop up in the chat, but I certainly invite you to um, raise any questions you have. And if I, if we don't get any questions, I will, I will turn to um, Matt and uh, Abhishek for some final thoughts for the day. Uh, I can't see any questions popping up yet. So maybe I'll ask you, Matt, to to give some, some concluding comments, if that's okay. Oh, I think I'll just say uh, thank you to you, Gavin Abhishek, and uh, of course the uh, attendees here on the call today. Thanks for uh, spending your time with us. And uh, look, I do hope you can benefit from that $100 voucher from uh, Leno. Please do uh, accept that offer. Um, as Gavin suggested, uh, that 100 US dollars uh, goes a long way on uh, Akamai's Leno. And Abhishek, maybe some, 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 some concluding words from you. Uh, well, uh, again, thank you all to the participants uh, and uh, Gavin to you and Matt for helping organize this session today. Uh, and if you are interested uh, in going through a free cloud assessment uh, through a digital transformation uh, academy workshop, we're more than happy to conduct that for you. Uh, 
again, just in conclusion, uh, just be mindful of how and where and when you plan your cloud strategy. And I hope that you partner with Fujitsu and Akamai to help uh, drive your success in your business. Thank you. No worries. Well, thank you very much, um, Matt and Abhishek. It's been great. Uh, I, I know that people will find a lot of value in that. I think that the weaving the path through the cloud journey is a complex thing nowadays uh, from a uh, from many, many di different dimensions. And on behalf of Akamai and Fujitsu, we'd like to appreciate uh, say thanks to the people that uh, stuck through the, the webinar. Um, again, take up those offers and thank you from the three of us. Bye-bye.